Ibogamine was first synthesized in 1965, and since then it's continued to draw interest from the chemical synthesis community, and a number of other syntheses have been reported. I've picked a synthesis from 1985 uh, to highlight here from Kuna and Ryder because I think it's interesting for a couple of different reasons. Uh, ibogamine is still of interest today. It's being studied as potential treatment for addiction. It's known that this molecule has anti-addictive properties. Uh, the thing that's really holding it back is the hallucinogenic potential and also the uh, associated toxicity, in particular cardiotoxicity uh, associated with this molecule. Uh, so this reference here, uh, David Olson and co-workers uh, have actually been working on making analogues of ibogamine that retain the anti-addictive properties um, but have a simpler chemical structure and don't have the associated toxicity. But anyway, I'm going to talk about this uh, 1985 synthesis in this video. And you can see ibogamine is also closely related to the uh, methoxylated natural product ibogaine. It just differs by the uh, methoxy group. So for the disconnection approach uh, for the 1985 synthesis, the first disconnection is this bond here between indole C1 and the isoquinucleidine that disconnects the molecule back to this tryptamine fragment where the nitrogen is still embedded in the rest of this uh, ring system here. And then over a number of synthetic steps, uh, this part of the molecule was derived from this cyclohexene epoxide. And this picture looks a bit ugly because you can see all of these stereo bonds are undefined. Uh, and this actually indicates a human element of the story here. Um, the work was published in 1985. Um, it's based on a synthesis that was actually completed in 1978. And so uh, Ryder in 1978, this is a PhD thesis. And so the work was done by Paul Ryder um, from his PhD. It seems that during that work, they were under the impression they had a completely stereoselective synthesis, but they were doing all of their characterization with a 100 megahertz NMR. And at some point, they gained access to a 250 megahertz machine, and then it turned out that they were able to distinguish they actually had diastereomeric mixtures in uh, many of the intermediates they'd assumed to be uh, stereochemically pure. So it's a bit unfortunate, really. Paul uh, Ryder completes this work in 1978 and then has to wait seven years for his supervisor to publish the work. It's at least a credit to them that they were careful enough to go back and look at the data and use more advanced instrumentation to clarify the stereochemical outcome. But unfortunately, it means the synthesis isn't particularly neat with regards to stereo control. Anyway, they made the epoxide from this uh, cyclohexene here with the ester groups on it. And this is a, an interesting cyclization reaction. This cyclohexene ring was uh, produced by the Schweitzer reaction. And so that involves uh, excising this two carbon fragment here. And so this carbon here is derived from the aldehyde group and the disconnection goes back to this branched uh, aldehyde diester. And this molecule here was made from the condensation between the pyrrolidine enamine of butanol and this uh, very reactive malonate derived Michael acceptor. I'm not going to do the first step because it's not particularly interesting, but it is worth spending some time on the Schweitzer reaction. Here's a, a reference from Schweitzer himself in 1965 that describes the process. It involves uh, this reagent here, vinyl triphenylphosphonium bromide. And normally uh, we're used to seeing uh, phosphonium salts like this as Wittig reagents, uh, but this actually has some different reactivity. You, you can imagine in a, in a Wittig sense, if we wanted to try and do a deprotonation here, it would actually be quite a difficult deprotonation and give us an unstable vinylic anion. Uh, this actually has more important reactivity as a Michael acceptor. And so the first thing that happens in this reaction, uh, sodium hydride is the base. This deprotonates the uh, diester at the very you know, acidic alpha position. And then we can get a Michael addition, so adding in to the uh, vinyl triphenyl phosphonium salt, which is a very good Michael acceptor, phosphorus can stabilize the anion at the alpha position here. And so you can see after the Michael addition, we have now set up an illid, which looks like a traditional reagent for a Wittig reaction. And indeed, it uh, intercepts the aldehyde in a, an intramolecular fashion there. Um, and then the rest of the reaction essentially looks like a a Wittig type process, this uh, uh, betaine decomposes uh, and we get the double bond and formation of the cyclohexene ring in fairly reasonable yield.
And now that the diester group has served its purpose by activating the Michael addition, we need to remove one of these groups, and that was accomplished by the fairly harsh reaction of uh, refluxing in DMSO with potassium cyanide, and this sounds like a fairly unpleasant reaction. You'd want to be very careful not to spill this on your uh, exposed skin. Um, but anyway, the, under Crapcho type conditions, one of the esters is removed, and it, it affords this product here, the ester uh, cyclohexene. This is where the stereochemical situation starts to get a bit more complicated because, of course, there's no real selectivity as to what ester group um, is decarboxylated, so we have a mixture of two isomers here. And then to make it even worse, uh, there's no selectivity on the subsequent epoxidation with MCPBA. So you can imagine there are actually four possible isomers here. Three were detected, and on the basis of their instrumentation, they weren't able to assign which isomer was which. Certainly they weren't able to preparatively separate these isomers, um, but they just took the mixture forward for the rest of the synthetic scheme. And uh, it turns out that was enough to get them where they needed to go anyway. And so with the epoxide in hand, uh, the next step was to take the stereochemically undefined epoxide, heat it in the presence of tryptamine, and this does a nucleophilic ring opening of the epoxide, uh, and then on further heating uh, at 220 degrees, so another reasonably harsh uh, reaction. Uh, the proposed structure in the paper is this molecule here, where the isoclonucleidine ring has been formed. Uh, you might be thinking at this point there's something interesting about the position of this amide, and hold that thought because we'll come back to it, but I want to go through the uh, ring opening in a bit more detail first. So let, let's consider the regioselectivity of this ring opening, because there needs to be a good reason why the epoxide uh, opens directly opposite the ester where we need it to be. Um, and also at this point I'll mention because we get the isoquinucleidine, we know that the nitrogen and the ester group were on the same face of the um, cyclohexane ring. And so whilst there was a mixture, we know that the productive reactant here is the trans ester epoxide, and maybe this was a, a major product in the reaction mixture, we're not sure. And then the ethyl group is still stereochemically undefined. Um, anyway, this is a classical example of the first Plattner rule in terms of the regioselectivity of the ring opening. So if we consider what's happening, uh, let's look at what happens if the nucleophile comes in on the right-hand side first. That would be a, a reaction like this. With the nucleophile, of course, is the tryptamine nitrogen. And if we open at this end, then this carbon has to move down a little bit to make a bond to the nucleophile. This carbon is going to move up once the uh, oxygen opens up and we get a tetrahedral carbon here. And this, unfortunately, will take us via a twist boat. And we know that that is uh, an energetic barrier. It's unfavorable to form the twist boat. And so the reaction doesn't follow this pathway. What happens is we get the nucleophile attacking at the other end of the epoxide, and it would open this way around. Well, then this carbon needs to move down a little bit to make the bond to the nucleophile. This carbon moves up. And then that means the molecule relaxes into a chair conformation, which is obviously the much lower energetic barrier. So the first Plattner rule explains the regioselectivity of the epoxide opening. And for the second part of this process, the thermal cyclization, now we know the ester and the nitrogen have to be on the same face of the cyclohexane ring. And conceptually, what is happening is something like this. Um, presumably the ring will have to flip into a boat conformation to bring these groups close enough together to react, but we must get formation of a, a lactam and loss of ethanol. Now, if we look at the structure from the paper, and I've actually reproduced the drawing from the paper here, uh, they propose this very interesting structure where the tryptamine side chain has become oxidized uh, at the same time that the ester carbon, which is this one here, has been reduced down to a methylene group. And so that would really be quite a remarkable internal redox isomerization. Anyway, I, I don't suggest this lightly, but I think what has happened here is the structure in the paper is actually wrong, uh, because you could imagine it would make an awful lot more sense if you're forming uh, the lactam using that carbon there, uh, retaining the carbonyl, and the product is actually something like this. So. I'm going to present a little bit more evidence later on um, to reinforce my claim, but for now I'm going to go through the rest of the synthesis assuming that their product is actually with the lactam inside the isoclonucleidine ring, uh, despite what is written in the paper.
we're almost at the end of the synthesis anyway. All that remains to be done is a derivatization of the axial oxygen with tosyl chloride. And whilst the ethyl group is still stereochemically undefined, we know that the oxygen has to be axial on the basis of the regioselective uh, epoxide ring opening, which is, of course, stereospecific. Um, so this oxygen is converted to a, a good leaving group, and then the tosylate is activated with aluminium trichloride, and then by heating in toluene, the cyclization happens, and this looks like the indole is reacting out of C2, but we know the indoles are much more reactive at C3, so I think what must be happening is the, the indole reacts at C3 like that, displaces the tosylate, and forms this six-membered ring, and then we would get migration of the more substituted secondary carbon down onto the indole C1. And then finally, loss of a proton would restore the aromaticity and the much nicer drawing uh, up here is the uh, proposed product. Uh, but again, I, I'm proposing the carbonyl to be here. The paper proposes the carbonyl to be here. Um, at this point, uh, mercifully, uh, through purification by crystallization, they were able to obtain one exclusive isomer uh, with the ethyl group in this equatorial position. So the stereochemical situation is finally cleaned up at this quite late stage in the synthesis. The final step of the process was to use lithium aluminium hydride to reduce out the lactam and afford racemic uh, ibogamine in 72% yield. And this is where some structural proof is presented in the paper. So they say, well, Again, remembering that this is the proposed structure in the paper, they say, we took natural ibogamine uh, and they treated it with iodine and sodium bicarbonate, as reported by Bartlett and co-workers in 1958. And they were looking at the naturally derived compounds and essentially what manipulations and degradations they could perform on them. Uh, and they say that you know, Bartlett in 1958 makes the lactam via oct oxidation, and we found that the natural product gave a material which was identical in all respects to the lactam that they derived from the intramolecular cyclization on the tosylate. And that's all well and good, but unfortunately if we go back and look at Bartlett's proposed structure, uh, which I've put here, uh, Bartlett proposes the lactam carbonyl in the position that I've suggested uh, we should expect it to be in. And if we look at their paper, uh, they take the natural abogamine here, they propose the iodine oxidation gives this compound here, and then lithium aluminium hydride Bartlett does this work as well and also gets back to natural ibogamine. Um, you bear in mind this is 1958, so there's not even any NMR in this paper. They have infrared um, spectroscopy, elemental analysis, and a melting point. And nowadays, I think the things we would be looking for would be some clever 2D NMR experiments, and in, in particular I, I would want to see the coupling uh, between these protons, because you can imagine that would be a very good way to tell where your oxidation had happened, because if you lose the relationship between these protons, then, then you might be more convinced the oxidation had gone here. Anyway, a final piece of evidence which comes from a paper in 2000, and by this point I really trust the structural characterization a lot more. Uh, White and co-workers were actually making uh, ibogamine in antiopure with a completely different route. And they come via an intermediate like this, and they have their dimethyl acetal here uh, set up for a nice Fischer indole synthesis to add the indole ring. Um, but anyway, they genuinely do have the oxidation at this position. And in their hands, they couldn't effect this reduction under exactly the same conditions that Kuna and Ryder were talking about. Lithium aluminum hydride was ineffective, and they eventually had to use uh, borane generated in situ to accomplish this reduction. So that's another piece of evidence to suggest that the structure in Kuna and Ryder's paper is actually wrong. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, it's a fairly reasonable synthesis of ibogamine. The stereochemical control isn't fantastic, um, but the structure in the paper, I think, is almost certainly wrong. They claim to have come through this lactam here, but I think the evidence points to them actually having the oxygen at this position. As to what kind of a mistake it is, it may just be a, a simple error in the diagram in the paper. I'm not sure whether they actually believed they had this compound, but it just goes to show that if, if something looks strange in the literature, it is worth looking into because sometimes it may be a mistake.